Well, hello. This is Cece Kim, and this is Jim Bacho for movies about music.、And、yeah, boy, oh boy, oh boy, it's been an eventful day.、Mm-hmm. Uh, we just、um, are in the aftermath of the slap heard around the world. Yes, with Will Smith slapping Chris Rock、mm-hmm. for a joke he told on stage. That's not. The episode that we thought we were going to have, we thought we'd do a Oscar recap and then go into this movie called Studio Six Six Six. Yes. And we chose that. Why did we choose that movie? Well, you already had it on your list, right? Yeah, and you picked it out. Yeah, and I picked it out. And then Taylor Hawkins passed away the other day. That's right. And he was in it because all the Foo Fighters were in yeah, it. Yeah. Right. So we'll talk about that movie, which is、mm-hmm. kind of a fun movie, and then we'll talk about Taylor Hawkins. But first, we've got to talk about、mm-hmm. the Oscars. Well, I don't know who won because I spent the whole the、oh. whole day at work and at Pilates, and so I didn't know anything until you sent me a message about <laughs> Will Smith apparently slapped Chris Rock, and I was like, "Well, hold on, let me look it up." And I saw the video right away. Yeah, you're my you're kind of my、um, my internet guru because、uh-huh. whenever I am not sure about something, you're on it. Uh huh. Yeah. And you know how to do all the search yes, words. Yes, because you're horrible at searching. I'm for terrible、yeah. at searching for things. This is all going to be new information for me.、Um, all I know is that Coda won Best Picture. Yeah, so Coda won Best Picture. Congrats to them because we've been cheering this film since we、mm-hmm. saw it and、mm-hmm. we loved it. Coda was nominated for three、mm-hmm. things. It won all three awards, so it swept、oh, its nominations. Yeah,、mm-hmm. which is kind of interesting. You'd think like, oh. The Academy is kind of coming around to this film very late、mm-hmm. because I think if they really wanted to award it as much as they did, there would be more nominations, like lead actress, for example,、mm-hmm. and she wasn't nominated and she should have been. So yeah, it won for best picture, for best adapted screenplay, and we really liked the screenplay, even though it's an, a story that's already been done in another movie. The、mm-hmm. screenplay was still excellent. Yeah, I, I mean, it was done a lot better than the original. That's kind of、yeah. what you were saying、yeah. during our podcast about、mm-hmm. it. So we have an episode on Coda,、mm-hmm. uh, a couple of episodes ago, and it won best supporting actor for Troy Kotsur. Oh, great! And I was moved,、mm-hmm. and it just you know triggered my remembrance of the film again. Just、mm-hmm. just seeing、mm-hmm. the the. The clips of these wins,、mm-hmm. so congratulations to Coda. Best director was who I thought it was going to be, which is Jane Campion,、mm. and that's the only win for Power of the Dog.、Mm-hmm. I think the Academy is awarding Jane Campion for、mm-hmm. you know a fine film. It was a little weird. We talked about it in our.、Mm-hmm. Um, Oscar podcast. You predicted this though that they were going to reward Jane Campion specifically. I did,、yeah. and then if it wasn't her, I thought it was going to be Steven Spielberg.、Mm-hmm. Best actress was Jessica Chastain. So、mm-hmm. our pick of Olivia Colman didn't win. Our desired pick, you know,、mm-hmm. not our prediction pick, but our desired pick of Olivia Colman, I think, didn't win. Best supporting, I said, was Troy Kotsur.、Mm-hmm. The best supporting actress was Ariana Dubose.、Oh, okay. Ariana Dubose. She won for West Side Story,、mm. and I remember watching West Side Story and thinking that、mm-hmm. she was the best actor. I thought, in the yeah,、movie. yeah,、definitely. she brought a lot of passion to it.、Yeah. During our podcast for the Academy Awards, I I said I'm going to discount her, thinking she was the lead actress, and I think I、Not、didn't、Maria. know who the names yeah, were. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> the our choice was Jesse Buckley. She、mm-hmm. didn't win.、Um, best International Feature, Drive My Car, so it got that,、mm. and that was nice. And then documentary. Yes, so documentary was Summer of Soul, which、yeah. we raved about. Best original screenplay was Belfast. So it's kind of the Academy, you know, handing out these、mm. awards to the, and that was written by Kenneth Branagh,、mm-hmm. handing out these awards to, you know, it was, it was a legacy、mm. uh, award show in a、mm-hmm. way, except that Steven Spielberg seemed to be left out. And then Dune. Mm-hmm. Swept, not swept all the categories, but it really hit all of the categories for technical categories. It won、Great. best sound,、yeah. best score for Hans Zimmer,、uh-huh. best cinematography,、cool. best film editing, best visual effects, and best production design. Cool. So I'm pretty happy with that because we thought Dune was stunning,、mm-hmm. just not deserving a screenplay or a directing or a best picture, right?、Mm-hmm. Best animated feature, no surprise here. Encanto won.、Mm-hmm. Best original song, did、mm-hmm. you hear who won? No. Billie Eilish. Oh, cool! That was、okay. your pick. Yeah, it was my pick. Yeah, so, Beyonce performed though. I saw that on my way back home from work. It was stunning. Yeah. Best actor 
went to Will Smith. Mm-hmm. So, do so you have, before we get into it, do you have any thoughts on the uh, on the awards? Yeah, I mean, it, it did. The Academy Awards did what the Academy Awards do, and I'm not surprised by any of it except for the slap, you know. Um, but none of that surprised me. Yeah, no, there was no big surprises. Yeah. I think I think Coda was inching up, and yeah. it was starting to get buzz. Like, I'm glad it was Coda. I'm glad it know? was Coda too. I'm yeah. just so glad that here's the things that I'm happy about. <laughs> and I'm sorry to do it by negating mm. some great people who worked on, you know, worked really hard on these films, but I'm glad that Power of the Dog did not win except for Jane Campion. Mm-mm. So none of the actor awards, none mm-hmm. of the technical awards, it, it won. The other one that didn't win anything is Licorice Pizza. Mm-hmm. And we didn't see that for our podcast mm-hmm. and then the night after we did our podcast mm-hmm. we decided to watch it and we were both miserable mm-hmm. <laughs> we did not like licorice pizza right you left after about 30 minutes uh-huh. you said i've had enough of this yeah because i'm really big on not wasting my time on movies you are yeah. and you made the the wise decision what i did stupidly was I watched up until the last maybe 20 minutes uh-huh. and then I turned it off because I knew uh-huh. it wasn't going to go anywhere uh-huh. and I knew how it was going to end mm-hmm. and I just didn't care. Right. So I'm just kind of happy that those two films didn't overtake these other finer films, mm-hmm. I think. I think B- Belfast could have won for more awards, mm-hmm. but I'm generally happy mm-hmm. with the way t- things turned mm-hmm. out. I agree with you. The, the Academy did what the Academy yeah. does. Yeah. I mean, I was mostly just annoyed by some of the things that were not nominated, like Bradley Cooper for Nightmare Alley. He's too hot, though. <laughs> that's told yeah, you about that's this, right. Yeah. Anyway, yeah. So, best actor was Will Smith, mm-hmm. but before they got to the best actor, so this was before he won. So before he won, and this is the thing that pisses me off. Uh-huh. Will Smith did this mm-hmm. while Chris Rock. I mean, there's so many things we can talk about, but let's just say this. <laughs> this was for Chris Rock announcing the best documentary, which yes, Questlove, Questlove won. Yeah. I went on the internet later mm-hmm. trying to find Questlove's acceptance speech because I wanted to hear it. Yeah, You can't find it because if you search for it, again, my searching powers yeah, are I terrible. Yeah. Eventually, I'll, I'll I, find found, it for you. <laughs> eventually I did yeah. find it. So I got to hear his speech uh-huh. and it was a fantastic speech. Mm-hmm. But he's this great moment mm-hmm. for him Yeah, is being overshadowed by Will Smith smacking. By a narcissist. By a narcissist. A okay, violent so narcissist. What are your thoughts on the slap? Well, okay. So this is I laughed when I first saw it, and then it made me a little angry because for a number of reasons. First of all, I'm so sick of these people. (laughs) These people, meaning I've been watching the same celebrities go through their shit for like the past 30 to 40 years of my life. Who do you mean in particular? Will Smith has been around since I was like six years old or something. Yeah. So basically, this is the backstory of this whole thing, which I later did a bunch of Google searches. I like wasted my entire day on I this. wasted yeah. the entire day. You you were off. I was <laughs> I had my own thing. Yeah. But, but we was... spent our time separately on our phones, exactly. I think, checking out what was going on. So I don't think this incident had anything to do with Chris Rock or the joke, right? Yeah. I agree um, except with that. that he had a history of like making fun of Jada. Yeah, he had apparently. some history. Of, uh, yeah. There were two incidents, I think, yeah. in the past. None of that was really that serious. I mean, mm-hmm. there are some like really serious jokes, like just really, really, really offensive jokes mm-hmm. that most people put up with and mm-hmm. then they just don't say anything. You mm-hmm. know, lots of all celebrities have gone through, mm-hmm. a, you know, different variations of this. Non celebrities go through. You know, whatever. People don't like you if you're successful and, you you know, you go through, you know, people talk about you, whatever. Mm -hmm. He somehow made this, he victimized himself in a way, himself and his wife in a way that, like, made it sound like he was abused. Chris Rock? No, no, Will Smith. Will Smith, yeah. That he was being, like, abused by all these people for no reason. It's like you put your business on, you know, like he was like, oh, like, you know, if you're a celebrity, like if you're famous and if you're successful, you're like, you have to take this abuse. I was like, we never asked you about your entanglement. We never asked you about your wife's bald spot, whatever, whatever. Nobody asked for any of this information and you are making it sound like everybody asks this, like, 
a societal level, we attacked you and abused you. Mm-hmm. That was that made me crazy. But there's people, there's certain celebrities who expose themselves so much by making their personal stuff public, mm-hmm. and then they're shocked that people respond to it and joke about it. Mm-hmm. I mean, there's no discipline. Yeah. Again, it's like so many things and so many things that we talk about on this mm-hmm. show about films is what you're doing at like... Is, is it authentic? Is it is it real? Not authentic in a, in a in a phony sense. Somehow that authentic has become a bad word. It's not a bad word. Are you authentic to you know just keeping it real? Yeah. If your reality that you're trying to keep is that you're going to expose all of your problems to the world, it's going to come back to you. Yeah. And you kind of have opened up. Yeah. That. And I'm not saying that people deserve that. People don't deserve verbal abuse. People don't. Reser- that's deserve. not verbal abuse though yeah, that's but, no, a joke but, like, what i'm saying is like i just don't want people to twist my words because that's that's what's been mm, happening yeah, okay. a lot i'm not saying that if you put your business out there you deserve to be treated in a certain way but what i'm saying is he was clearly not the victim in this case you know who the victim was chris rock is the victim absolutely well so there's on a couple of levels yeah. the, the thing that upset one the quest love thing upset me yeah because your your arrogance and your narcissism yeah. is denying him his moment. Yeah, totally. Chris Rock is on stage doing his craft. This is what he does. This is how he makes a living. He was doing his job. He was doing his yeah. thing. And apparently he was right he was reading a joke that was written for him. I'm not sure if that's true. But anyway, he's doing his job. Mm-hmm. And here comes a guy <laughs> mm-hmm. on stage breaking the wall of mm-hmm. his art, yeah. of his craft, slapping him in the face. It would be the equivalent of I don't know if Will Smith can ever get a theater play Uh role, (laughs) but if Will Smith is on stage pouring his heart out in a dramatic role in the theater Uh on stage and Chris Rock came off from stage right and slapped him in the face, Mm -hmm. it's the same thing. Yeah, it is. I totally agree. That's exactly, yeah, that was my exact thought too. I know how it feels to be smacked on the face without warning. And I also know what it feels like to be so attacked while you're doing your job and you have to finish it, that you have to keep your composure. Right. Yeah. Yeah. And when I saw him, he was, he just, he didn't even like flinch. There was a fraction of a microsecond of a moment where it, where Chris Rock, if you watch his hand, it seems mm-hmm. like he's thinking of pulling back to, yeah, yeah. to punch or maybe trying to defend himself. There's a whole nother story from Chris Rock's side. And know? we haven't heard from him. Yeah. And, and, you know, and then he's, gonna wait his time and maybe he'll deal with it with comedy yeah maybe but but what i'm saying is like and then will smith you know he wrote a fucking memoir called will with his face on it you know that i think that says a lot about a person but people were saying like oh in his memoir he mentioned that like he felt powerless because he couldn't defend his mother i heard the same story and i'm just like bullshit that does not give you agency okay so this is a problem too there's a story in the guardian basically giving background as to why will smith may have violently attacked another person <laughs> while he's doing his work mm-hmm. that you know this thing about his mother yeah. then other people come on and they say are you normalizing mm-hmm. violence yeah it's no excuse everybody has their shit in their life yeah. that doesn't justify you walking up on stage and smacking somebody absolutely not the other thing that i want to talk about there's a couple more things i want to talk about and see what you think this incident mm-hmm. is going to be analyzed like the Zabruder film. Totally, yeah. <laughs> it's going to be broken down. <laughs> the interesting thing that happens in this, and it's there's a film, there's a movie aspect to this. Mm. This is live video, right? Mm-hmm. Okay, first of all, on the broadcast, I watch the broadcast version and I watch the uncut version. They're different. But in both of them, what you see is there's the joke and Will Smith laughs. And Jada Pinkett Smith is sitting quite some distance away from him. I'm not quite sure what's going on there. But she is obviously not amused at all. Mm -hmm. Will Smith is laughing. Because she's the real narcissist. But anyway, yeah. (laughs) (laughs) But here's the thing. Uh Cut. Yeah. Back to Chris Rock. Uh And the camera is on him. We don't have a camera on what happened in that moment where did she give him the stink eye, like, why are you laughing? Did she come over and say, that really hurt me? Mm -hmm. Did she say, go up on stage and punch that guy in the face? Well, we don't know. Right, obviously. But we see Chris Rock's face, and then the realization of, oh, shit, Mm -hmm. something bad is going to happen right now. But it's interesting that there's that film cut, there's that live video cut where, you know, 
cut mm-hmm. to camera two, right? Mm-hmm. So that's kind of interesting. We, we we don't know what happened in the moment as he changed his mind and didn't think it was funny anymore and thought it a moment of violence was was needed. So I thought that was interesting. The other interesting thing is <laughs> that he then wins the award. Mm-hmm. <laughs> yeah, it's hilarious. Oh my God. Did you hear his speech? Yeah, it was insufferable. I need to find it. Talk about Denzel. Apparently Denzel pulled him aside and said to him, during your highest moment, the devil will come to you or some shit like that. Right. And I'm sorry. (laughs) And he was crying. He apologized to everybody but Chris Rock. Mm -hmm. He's a toddler. Yeah. He's an entire toddler. Okay. Here in slightly edited form, I'm taking this from a newspaper. Here's, Here's Will Smith's acceptance speech, part of his acceptance speech, not the full thing, I should say that. Quote, in this time of my life, in this moment, I am overwhelmed by what God is calling on me to do and be in this world. I'm being called on in my life to love people and to protect people and to be a river to my people. And then that little pause there. I know to do what we do, you have to be able to take abuse and you have to smile and pretend that's okay. End quote. Here's my impression of those words. It's very trained language of people who feel themselves victims. Yeah, totally. Because I have to smile and pretend that's okay. Mm -hmm. That's what real victims of violence and abuse and war and rape say. And he's appropriating this language. He's a narcissist. Narcissists appropriate this kind of language and they victimize themselves when they themselves, and that he's essentially gaslighting Chris Rock. He's essentially Mm -hmm. gaslighting everybody involved. I think it's interesting that Jada Pinkett Smith was the first person that I noticed with this narcissistic, like, you know, behavior and Mm -hmm. like these wordings, but I I don't know what happens when both of them are narcissists, but Mm -hmm. like they both, you know, and another thing that happens when you're in a relationship with a narcissist is that you kind of become one. Mm. That's another thing. Yeah, that makes sense. Yeah. Yeah. But I think that this couple is highly problematic. I never want to hear about them again Mm -hmm. after this. I always thought it was interesting to appropriate Denzel Washington Mm -hmm. into his, um, yeah, creating an ally there. And and I think Denzel is thinking tonight as he goes home, oh shit. Maybe, or I don't know. You know, don't we know. don't know who Denzel is either. True. You know? Yeah, that's like, true. We don't know what kind of person he is. Yeah, that's true. That's true. So that's the thing. That's what I'm saying. Like, I don't know these people. So I try yeah. not to say judgmental things about them. But what I can say is that as a society, we are coddling these adults who act like children. And then, but the thing is, like, with every every time we coddle someone like that, there are people who suffer for, you know, as a consequence, like Chris Rock or anybody who had to deal with his bullshit mm-hmm. afterwards or, mm-hmm. you know, the staff or, you know, people who have stakes in this, in whatever, right? Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. People who actually do the work, mm-hmm. the writers, I, you know, people suffer yeah. because we coddle these people. I don't like that about, like, I I just don't like that. Like, I I really don't like this. And and another thing is, (laughs) this is going to be, this is very problematic, what I'm about to say, but I I truly believe it. And I, I don't really, I'm not ashamed of saying this, but let's say that Will and Jada were truly artists that I respect, whose work I truly respected. I might feel differently about this whole situation. Oh, I see what you're saying. I think the the well, part you, that made you, it so unbearable okay, to me. That's a really good point. That's a really is that, good point. Who the fuck are you? Who, what did you make, either of you? Like I don't. Yeah, I was going to get to that. Yeah, Actually, like, that's a good point because <laughs> now I'm not a fan of the idea of this all of this canceling going on, and that's a whole other issue. Um, yeah. And I'm not calling for Will Smith to be canceled or anything like that. Absolutely not. I think that he should be judged because it's his own actions. Um, but I don't think he should be canceled, nor should anybody else. And if I did respect his work, I might think differently. And that's a really important <laughs> thing to say. I think you're, I mean, yeah. it's funny the way you're saying it, yeah. but I think you're absolutely right. Mm-hmm. It is going to create a different like let's standard. say let's say okay from the summer of soul documentary like hypothetically speaking i saw i never i had forgotten that abby lincoln and max roach were a couple back then mm-hmm. so max roach legendary fascinating drummer yeah abby lincoln legendary jazz singer they were a couple and they were performing on stage together 
let's say, you know, at some show, Max Roach, like, punched somebody. I would be like, oh, wow, they had, like, a very interesting relationship dynamic, mm-hmm, you know? Mm-hmm. I would have been, like, I would have read this whole thing very differently. Mm-hmm. But what I saw today was just two talentless narcissists mm-hmm. that I keep hearing about when I never asked for yeah. their business and everybody's talking about them. That's mm-hmm. what upsets me. It's just like, I don't want to talk about them anymore. Like, I don't want Jada to get any more press. Like, yeah, what the right, hell? Right, right. Yeah. We're not fans. And I, I find him to be, um, you know, it also apparently in his book, he says this that this persona that he adopts is to protect himself. Whatever. I don't like your persona that you yeah. present. So, yeah. Have we covered yeah. this, do you yeah, think? Yeah, I think yeah. we've covered this enough. Right. Yeah. Let's take a little break and then we'll talk oh. about the movie. All right, we're back, everybody. Yeah. And we are going to talk about the movie Studio 666, Mm -hmm. which is a film released this year in theaters, 2022. It's a comedy horror film Mm -hmm. directed by B.J. McDonnell. Okay. Based on a story from Dave Grohl. Okay. So this is about Dave Grohl, and it's about the Foo Fighters, and apparently they recorded an album in this very house. Oh, they did? Yeah, and um, Dave Grohl came up with a movie about it. Oh. Yeah, so it's a silly little horror movie. Yeah, it's very campy. It's very... And in that sense, I thought it was great. <laughs> I, I like, if that's what it. they were going for, I'm like, this is amazing. I'm not usually a fan of camp, but um, or mm-hmm. B-movies. You know, like, there's people out there who love B-movies. Yeah. I'm usually not a fan of that. Um, but I'm this, okay with it. I, I yeah. enjoyed this. Yeah. Just because it was silly. And there was a distinctly 90s feel that made me very yeah. nostalgic. I mean, you know, just seeing Dave Grohl in the first place is, mm-hmm. like, very 90s. But there was a whole, like, an undertone to it, like... Of the 90s. I don't know if it was done deliberately, but, you know, I mean, they're a bunch of middle-aged children, right? Like middle-aged rockers Mm -hmm. who didn't grow up. And so they're still using the lingo. Yeah. Yeah, right, right, right. That kids used in the 90s. Yeah, right. As Yeah, so this is like, well, these people are probably, what, five to ten years older than me. Although Pat Smear seems like he's quite old. (laughs) Yeah. But, um, yeah, they're they're older than me, but, but... I was around during that time of, uh-huh. of all of that going yeah. on. Um, yeah, it has a, like that nostalgic feel yeah. to it. Basically, there's like, it's... it's There's there's not much of a plot no, that a, you wouldn't expect from this kind of movie. Like as soon as you, like the opening scene is an indication of what the entire plot is going to be. Yeah, yeah, and we're not, we can't possibly spoil this movie. So right. don't worry about yeah. that. Um, you can keep listening. I thought it was interesting in that it also, you know, I'm always trying to see the subtext of, mm-hmm. of these kind of things. Even in a movie like this, there's something to it about the idea of being the leader of a band. Mm, yeah. And kind of the horror, mm-hmm. finger quotes, of having to lead a band. Totally. And thinking, why am I doing this? And why am I trying to get these people to do this? I'm just, <laughs> why can't I just, do, why can't people just shut up and play the drums, uh-huh. for example, uh-huh. or play the guitar when uh-huh. I want them to? Uh-huh. And there was, you know, there's a slow elimination of all the band members, <laughs> you know, being murdered. And it felt to me like Dave Grohl's kind of wish fulfillment in a horror movie. <laughs> I see. Yeah, I know exactly what you're saying. Yeah, not that he wants any of them dead. No, like, but obviously. this is the subconscious yeah. stuff. Yeah, yeah, it is. It, it was. If you go deep into the psyche of it, there's a lot. There's a lot. There's a lot there with that kind you of thing. You could isn't there? totally unpack this in that way. Yeah. At, at some point, I thought like, wow, this is a whole metaphor for like the label. You know? Yeah, so there's the yeah. label. That's part of the plot is the label says, oh, why don't you record at this house where mm-hmm. there was this murder before? of mm-hmm. a? So the idea is there was this murder before. Mm-hmm. Another band tried to record in this house mm-hmm. and then the band leader went crazy and killed all the band members yeah. and then hung himself. Mm-hmm. There's a book. So there's kind of like a... Um, mm-hmm. Evil Dead kind of aspect yeah. to it where there's this evil book. Yeah, totally. <laughs> that, um, that needs the sacrifice. Yes, needs of the blood, blood, yeah, blood yeah. sacrifice. Yeah. And there's the song that they have to finish <laughs> that, was, that will that never was. end. <laughs> yeah. And it's really hard to explain why the song is so hard to finish. But, and you know that, like, if you're in a band and you're trying to finish a song, like, we in, in our own band, 
the endings of every song is like a complicated. It's like such an ordeal, right? Mm-hmm. And if you write the song together, it becomes even more complicated. Yeah, there's a moment when Dave Grohl <laughs> says to Taylor Hawkins, mm-hmm. "No, I wanted to go bam, bam, but a bam, bam." Yeah. And Taylor Hawkins says, "I'm pretty sure I, I did exactly <laughs> <Yeah>. just that." <laughs> But yeah, like just the whole idea of, right, like this is my idea and this Uh is my brilliant idea and Mm -hmm. can't you guys just do this? Mm -hmm. And then, and then it never ends. And there's another thing in this movie is like Mm -hmm. watching all of the band members just kind of looking at Dave. Yeah, yeah. Like what the, what the fuck are you doing? Yeah. And he's just riffing on this. He's riffing on this tune. Yeah. It go the song goes to about forty. What do they say? Forty two minutes, mm-hmm. which used to be the length of an album. Mm-hmm. And mm-hmm. there used to be bands in the seventies mm-hmm. who would make forty two minute songs. Yeah, the bands that you listened. To. Yeah, yeah. Um, Jethro Tull did that, <laughs> or you could put it into four movements, as Yes yeah. did on a double album. Uh-huh. At some point, you said that this is turning into a prog rock. Yeah, prog rock yeah. opus kind yeah. of song, yeah. There were so many things that I thought were funny, but, you know, I might as well, we might as well just put this out there. Sure. It feels weird now mm. because Taylor Hawkins passed away. Right. Of seemingly this... an o- overdose or something. Yeah, right? I mean, whenever you hear on the news found unresponsive in a hotel Mm -hmm. room it's either drugs or suicide yeah so it had to be one of the two Mm -hmm. sometimes it's both yeah i guess we can jump into the taylor hawkins conversation it seems like you know i read an interview with rolling stone Mm -hmm. rolling stone put out you know they did a something recent like Mm -hmm. this year i think on foo fighters and they interviewed the whole band and Mm -hmm. you know when a rolling stone writer does a story on a band they interview every band member Mm -hmm. what they did is they published the entire interview with Taylor Hawkins that was not in the original story. Mm -hmm. And I was captivated by it. I read the whole thing. Yeah, He talks about how he can never do drugs while he's playing because it takes too much concentration and he has to really think about it. And he sounds to me like a kind of an introverted, you know, shy perfectionist. I could totally see that. Yeah. Yeah. And obviously he's had some history of drug problems. In 2000, he went into a two-week coma Mm -hmm. from a heroin overdose and Dave Grohl sat by his side and Mm -hmm. um, eventually came out of it. Dave Grohl wrote a song about him. Mm -hmm. But the interviewer asked him if he was clean and he didn't really answer the question. Mm -hmm. You know, he seemed fully functional, Mm -hmm. but that's the thing. It's always a surprise. Chris Cornell was the same thing, right? Mm -hmm. Everybody thought he was fine even though he went through some depression before he yeah. killed himself. Yeah. But yeah, it's it's just really sad. Yeah. And 10 different chemicals in his body apparently. Yeah. So I mean, I'm bringing this up because um I noticed like in my own tiny experiences and when I was watching this movie, it was very clear to me that like being a band leader and having these bandmates is so much like child rearing. <laughs> or ch- or babysitting yeah maybe? or babysitting but but more like child rearing when you have a band like the Foo Fighters who've like lasted that long who you know it was your idea everything was your idea in the first place and these people are kind of like your children in so many ways like and yeah. you love them like you love your children right. I don't know I'm that's the overall vibe that I got from their dynamic mm. in the movie. And then I thought about it and I read some articles after. Mm, you know. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. And they're kind of looking at you like, because you're supposed to get this shit done. Yeah. Like, and, we, and I've been, I mean, obviously you've been in the role of a band leader. Mm. I'm always looking to the band leader to mm. make decisions. So yeah, we've each had different perspectives yeah. on that. Yeah. And especially when you're the primary songwriter. And this was all your idea. And if it's bad, it was your bad idea. Right. That, and that's in the film. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> that's the thing. And then there's this like, you know, there's this pressure that, oh my God, these are wonderful, amazing musicians who could be playing for other people. You know? <laughs> they could be, yeah. They could totally be out there doing better shit with their time. Mm-hmm. And there's so much at stake. Yeah. There's a lot of pressure to being Dave And this is part of the movie, too, is that they have to finish this album. Mm -hmm. And they have a limited time, and he's thinking, oh, we're just going to, we're going to be able to kick it out really quick, and it doesn't doesn't turn out that way. Yeah. So it's like this beautiful thing, your purpose in life, Mm -hmm. your passion, your everything. This Mm -hmm. is also such a burden, you know. Taylor Hawkins, it yeah. seems, died of a drug overdose. You can interject in here the element of drugs, which mm-hmm. is, I think, a lot of the reason why artists and musicians 
mostly in the rock and roll and jazz mm-hmm. and, you know, world, pop world, why they take drugs and why people who are creative artists and mm-hmm. the, you know, the the genesis of these songs, mm-hmm. why they take drugs. Mm-hmm. The demon possession of Dave Grohl from this house mm-hmm. is kind of like drugs. Yeah. It gives, initially it gives him this burst of energy and he's like doing all these time changes and these shifts in the <laughs> song and he's suddenly just ripping solos yeah. on the guitar. But then it slowly turns into this thing where all of his relationships with his band members are falling apart. Mm-hmm. So it's almost like this possession thing is a humorized version of of how drugs mm-hmm. also can take over. Yeah. So yeah. there's so much to, if you there's want to, to unpack, unpack yeah, yeah, you could unpack a yeah. lot. And That's I don't think it's reading too much, but I always wonder, you know, like Zizek, you know, talks mm-hmm. about reading films and sometimes the filmmaker doesn't know what he's doing when he's doing it. Right, right. So the, there's the question of whether Dave Grohl went in with this allegory intentionally or if it's just what came out. Mm-hmm. You know, sometimes these feelings come out in a writer. Mm-hmm. I thought it was interesting that mm-hmm. I was trying to see if... <laughs> The band members were being eliminated by their the point that they entered that they joined the band. Yeah. So the newest member would. So the newest member of the band Mm -hmm. gets killed first, and then on down the line until Pat Smear and the other guy I can't remember his name, the bass player, are left. Mm -hmm. It almost does it perfectly, kind of like a uh, Usual Suspects where he takes people out by name. Yeah. It almost does it perfectly, except for two. Two characters. Mm -hmm. The keyboard player is the second one killed. Mm -hmm. Again, not spoiler. And then the the guitar player is... But the guitar player is the first one killed. I think that's reversed. Oh, okay. So only that. It's like... Why didn't you guys just do it that way? Yeah, yeah. Just for fun. Yeah. But then, yeah, Pat and the bass player are the last ones to die. Right, right. Yeah. I'm sure there was something intentional about it. Maybe, but yeah. and maybe I'm getting the the maybe I'm getting the sequence wrong, and maybe it did, it it was in sequence, yeah. and I've just got the band history incorrect. But I thought that was interesting. Yeah, that is very funny. <laughs> <laughs> I I don't I'm not re- terribly well versed in this '90s rock history as much as I want to be because I have like I'm I'm sort of fascinated. After the fact. But, mm. I mean, if there's one band that I'm really familiar with, it's Nirvana. Yeah, and this is Dave's second yeah, major I loss. I can't imagine what that must feel like. Like, I, it's just, that was the first, you know, that wasn't the first thing that went through my mind. But, I, you know, I did yeah. think about that. And I was like, and there was this article written about it, like, mm. Dave Grohl's tragic Yeah, and I would say losses. he was... Yeah, he was even closer to Taylor than he was to Kurt Cobain, I think. Like, I mean, obviously, because he had more time with... Yeah, more, yeah like 22 yeah. years or something yeah. like that, more than that. But um, but also, like, they were best friends. Mm-hmm. And with a little bit of little brother mm. thing going yeah, on. Yeah, I could see that, yeah. Um, but they, like, Dave would always have Taylor with him doing interviews. You know, they mm-hmm. would swap off on guitar mm-hmm. and drums. You kind of feel like once Taylor joined the band, that those two were like brothers. Yeah, and that it's kind of like a little bit addressed in the movie. And if you, you know, we saw it after we learned about the death of Taylor Hawkins, mm-hmm. and then it felt, it felt really weird because he, you know, mm-hmm. he says in the movie like, "Hey, we understand each other. Like we're both drummers." You yeah, know? that's true. There were there were a lot of these um, references, mm-hmm. these drummer references, especially, yeah, right. and. Um, there was that one scene where we laughed, we both laughed hysterically because Dave Grohl, like they had just moved into the house and they were setting up all the instruments, like the speakers mm-hmm. and the drums. Mm-hmm. And Dave Grohl was like, can you move it just a hair to the right? Oh God, that was so funny. <laughs> He's setting up the drum kit and I do this. I do this. Like setting the snare in mm-hmm. the right position mm-hmm. on the drum kit, mm-hmm. it can be millimeters. Yeah, I've seen drummers do this. And he's doing it because when you hit the drum, Uh the sound of a scream happens from the ghost. I guess there's a certain resonance in this one position, Uh which is funny. But again, I think that's just a a reference to how drummers meticulously put this snare drum in position. Yeah. Yeah, that was funny. Yeah, it was really funny. (laughs) (laughs) And then the L sharp... Oh like, my god. Like, yeah. So they so he says that the key the song is in is in L and then he later says it's in L sharp. Yeah. And so and the rest of the band is supposed to kind of figure out what that must mean. <laughs> this but this again yeah. is an allegory for the genius. Yes, I know. Right? <laughs> and so there were a lot of these really funny like especially if you've been in any band like yeah. it's just it's really really funny. Mm-hmm. 
the way that he makes fun of everyone, including himself, but especially mm-hmm. himself, is mm-hmm. something that I really appreciate. Yeah, he really made fun of himself yeah, in this movie. I really, really appreciate yeah. that. I, I love some, anybody who could do that. Yeah. Um, so I really liked it. I liked it too. Yeah. It, it, it gets like 50% approval on Rotten Tomatoes. I thought it was great. Mm-hmm. And it was there was a couple of genuinely scory, scory Go- scary, scary and gory, gory. moments. Mm-hmm. I couldn't watch most of it. Yeah, the, you turned your head yeah. for some of it. And, it's and they were legitimately gory. They were like, legit. Yeah. yeah, there's legitimate old school, again, yeah. Evil Dead yeah. style gore yeah. in this movie. Movies about music. I want to transition into talking a little bit more about Taylor Hawkins mm-hmm. because you were talking about the 90s. Mm-hmm. And I became aware of Taylor Hawkins in 1995. Oh. During that time, I was a big fan of Letterman. Everybody, I think most people that I knew anyway, were fans of David Letterman. Mm -hmm. And he would always have the best guest bands on. Mm, Like he had R.E.M. on before anybody knew. I discovered a band called Innocence Mission watching Mm -hmm. his show. Just on down the line, he would take risks on having artists on his show. Mm -hmm. And he's become known for that. So you always have to stay tuned Letterman, even though now it's like one fifteen in the morning, mm. you'd have to see, this is before you could watch things at any time, you'd have to watch the band. And so I saw this band and it was someone named Alanis Morissette. And she said, she sang uh-huh. and she and her band, apparently she was 19 years old in, in 1995 mm-hmm. during this performance. Mm-hmm. And you can YouTube it. And it's incredible. It's There's these moments of, I mean, just completely unbridled Alanis Morissette. And I mm-hmm. saw that when it came on. Mm-hmm. The thing that I was really watching, in addition to her, was uh, Taylor Hawkins. Mm. And his drumming was fantastic, and he had this great energy. It reminded me when I first got into drums, mm. watching Terry Bozio mm. from Missing Persons. That dates me. And he had the same kind of energy, and that's mm-hmm. why I got into the drums. So seeing Taylor Hawkins, mm-hmm. I was like, I'm going to watch this guy and pay attention to his mm-hmm. career. He just has a great energy about him. Mm-hmm. I saw in an interview that he gave, the question was asked, how do you compare your drumming to Dave Grohl's? And he is, he will speak effusively about Dave Grohl. He is so much in appreciation mm-hmm. of Dave's drumming, who... I think, honestly, for my taste, Taylor Hawkins is a better drummer than Dave. Mm-hmm. Um, but he will, Taylor will say, Dave Grohl is just incredible. He said, Dave Grohl is like John Bonham, whereas I am like Stuart Copeland. Mm. And that totally fits. Dave Grohl mm-hmm. is a behind the beat kind mm-hmm. of player, old, kind of old school mm-hmm. rock uh-huh, uh-huh. kind of player. Taylor Hawkins is more of a push the beat, play on top of the beat, give it energy, mm-hmm. drive the beat forward. Mm-hmm. And that's more the way, the style that I play. And just watching him again on this Alanis Morissette. And that's a hard song to play drums on. Like yeah. I remember, yeah. Yeah, and it's and he holds the groove so solid, yeah. but he's doing, and I was remembering, I used to do this in the 90s. Mm-hmm. It was, you know, this period of like, 1991 through 95, Mm -hmm. where there's a certain style. And Mm -hmm. I was totally doing this. And a lot of people were real fans of Stuart Copeland. And he would do a lot of flourishes on the hi-hat, splash cymbal stuff, and just do a lot of accents Mm -hmm. and really do dynamics. And he was doing that. Taylor Hawkins was doing that on You Ought to Know. Mm -hmm. And I just totally mocked. Mm -hmm. Not him specifically, but he was another that I kind of opened my brain and fed Taylor Hawkins into my mm. into my drumming style. Mm-hmm. So, you know, in terms of my own style, mm-hmm. it's a mix of everything I've ever mm-hmm. heard in my life. Oh, I don't yeah. I don't mock any particular mm-hmm. drummer, but there was that period in the in the early 90s when people like Dave Abruzis mm-hmm. from Pearl Jam, he, you know, he oh, was kind yeah, of my yeah. style. You saw that video yeah. of them doing um stuff on Unplug. Yeah, yeah, Porch. Yeah. Anyway, I'm I'm rambling, but I really enjoyed his style of drumming. I mean that yeah, that makes a lot of sense. There's there's mm-hmm. it's a very distinct like style that was present in the nineties yeah. and the early two thousands. Um, yeah, and passion. Like yeah. people were playing with real like yeah. raw energy. And drummers were a big deal. Like, they were. Yeah. You knew the drummers in every yeah, band. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I don't know if you can I mean, I'm sure with niche, you know, kind of bands they know the drummers but i don't know any drummers names no it's different now yeah Yeah. it's different it's very different like the 90s were the drummers were important like you know who the bass player was yeah you knew who the Mm -hmm. bass player was it was all you know and they didn't like just rotate ad nauseum like they weren't just like you know going around doing sessions all the time right 
like they are kind of today. Yeah. I think it's very hard to keep a band together today. Mm. Today you've got ringers who are going mm-hmm. from from session to session. And that's, there's nothing wrong with that. But like, mm-hmm. you know, back then, I guess like you could really just stick with a band, like tour and... A band work. was a family. Yeah. And they and did, that, <laughs> they did mm-hmm. the joke, the joke where they did... Pearl Jam High Five. Yeah. I know. Which is Pearl Jam on their album 10. On the cover, you see, you know, five sets of hands uh-huh. doing a high five. And they, so they did that twice in the movie. Pearl Jam High Five. That was really funny. But it's that thing of the the family, you know, yeah. the band is the family. Yeah. Yeah. It's like, I, I want to see more of these kinds of movies because okay. I also really want, um, like, I feel like the 90s is kind of disappearing on us, you know? Yeah, I saw a comment on the Alanis video uh-huh. that said the 90s passed us by way too quickly. Yeah, and I just I have so much nostalgia for particularly the 90s because mm-hmm. I was alive, but I was too young to enjoy a lot mm-hmm. of this stuff. And by the time I grew up, the 90s were gone, you know. And I'm talking about the 90s in a very symbolic sense, like, you know, not like the decade, like, you know, not just like the time, but just the culture and just like everything about it. There's a lot of stuff that I I would and the people who were there are still alive and they're not mm-hmm. even old like you know you're still here and you're not old you know like I'm still kicking. yeah like you're still kicking and you're still able to like you know make music and make movies mm-hmm. and stuff like that and so I want more Gen Xers to kind of like you know talk about mm, yeah to to make more of this kind of art like yeah yeah just this I'm calling out to all Gen Xers but the thing is I heard on a podcast. I love this podcast called Everything is Fine with these two um, 50-something, 49, 50-something-year-old ladies who were magazine editors back in the day. And they were talking about how (laughs) the slacker Gen Xer is now like the Gen Xer who just refuses to do (laughs) self-promotion. Oh, my God, that's me. And they were like, yeah, we we kind of like, you know, we're all middle aged and we're trying to like we're, we could still be relevant, but we co- kind of collectively like it's not in our DNA. This is my world right now. I'm, I'm trying to <laughs> and I thought about you. Yeah. stuff that I'm doing and I just can't do it. It all seems so silly. So you're not alone. Your entire yeah. generation apparently feels very much, very strongly about this. And even those who are, you know, just very much out there in the 90s, those who ran magazines and, you know, were touring and leading bands and, you know, were commanding, like, audiences and running shit. Even those people, they feel like, "Ah, I can't be bothered. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. (laughs) Why do I have to do this? (laughs) Yeah. It was a weird transition period because we were like, you know, if you're a musician, you're learning an instrument Mm -hmm. and you're looking for other people who who know other instruments in Mm -hmm. order to develop a a band. Mm -hmm. But then there's also like digital technology is starting to happen in the 90s. And you can also, another thing that I was involved with was doing sound design and working on early, early software, um, mm. Sound Edit 16, it mm-hmm. was called. And then the mixing part of it was called Deck 2. Mm. And it was the 16-bit, you know, stuff. Mm-hmm. So, you you know, you're start, starting to see that transition into DIY kind of stuff mm-hmm. that was happening. Yeah, I was really happy to be 21 years old in 1990. Yeah. Yeah, we're, we're going to do the movie Singles at some mm-hmm. point, and we'll really get into our nostalgia yeah. for that period of time. What else can we say? I mean, Taylor, I wanted to show you a video, but, you know, we we can end if we want. But Taylor Hawkins singing a cover mm. just days ago, uh. singing in Chile, I think, mm-hmm. singing Somebody to Love by Queen. Queen, yeah. With Dave Grohl on drums. Mm. And he has a really, really good voice. Mm. A lot of drummers can sing. Yeah, that's true. Yeah. yeah, yeah. You think that a lot of drummers who have who have gotten behind, you know, out from behind the drum kit and... Oh, no, no. I think it's the same. I mean, I don't play the drums, but I think I I feel like there's something that bonds us, drummers and singers. Oh, well, absolutely. Yeah, Yeah, there's the voice and the drum. There are a lot of guitar players who think they can sing, Mm -hmm. but a lot of drummers can secretly sing and they just don't. Mm, Yeah. I'm going to leave it at that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, now, if you really think about it, the only people you need in a band 
or a drummer and a singer. Yeah, yeah. No, and, and in a lot of cultures, that's all they have. And a lot of cultures, yeah. that's, I mean, that's the origin of culture. Yeah. We've talked about this before. Yeah. But the drummer and the singer, mm -hmm. it sounds terrible, mm -hmm. but really you've got the rhythm and the drums and mm -hmm. then you've got the the melody and the and the mm -hmm. singer. What mm -hmm. you don't have is harmony. Yeah. But, but you, um, if you have more singers, then you, that's, true. Yeah. yeah. So you got like a bunch of drummers and a bunch of singers and that's a party. Yeah. Any final thoughts about Studio 666, the Oscars, Taylor Hawkins, rest in peace. Oh, my God, what a just a ebullient, uh, happy seeming. It's always the happy ones who seem to oh. take themselves out, isn't it? Yeah, it's it's so sad. I mean, all, you know, yeah, now, the more I think of it, the sadder I become because it's such a waste. He was very young. I think 50 is young now, ever since yeah. I married you. I'm like... <laughs> I'm like, oh, 50 is so well, young. Well, 50 freaks but it the is. fuck out of me. Yeah. No, but it, it is young, you know? It is. There's a lot, like, look at you. You're, you. There's a lot of life, and you're, you know, you you behave like a teenager. I do. Yeah, and when you see it, when you see him in the movie, he's the youngest looking one. Yeah. And he's behaving like a teenager. He has mm -hmm. a teenager type of vibe. Mm -hmm. And the thing is, like, I always say that rock and rollers don't age. There's something about musicians, but particularly rock musicians who don't age. There's a spirit that, as that's long as it. that's alive... That's the word. Yeah. Spirit. They mm -hmm. have young spirits. Mm -hmm. It kind of feels like a very young person died. That's so well said. Yeah. That's, exa that's exactly mm -hmm. it. Yeah. And you see someone who's a very playful person yeah, and yeah. Still, still enjoying mm -hmm, mm -hmm. life and enjoying exactly. the energy of life. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. He's, I mean, by all accounts, he was just beloved by everybody. Mm -hmm. He left behind a wife and uh, I think... At least one or two kids, mm -hmm, I think. Mm -hmm. But it, there's something about, I don't know, the ones who are outgoing and trying to please others and trying to make others laugh and trying to make sure others are enjoying yep. life seem to be the ones who are often troubled. Mm -hmm. And yeah, rest in peace. Yep. Yeah. Well, yeah. You, you get to jam with your idol, mm -hmm. Kurt Cobain now. Oh, that's so sad. <laughs> <laughs> Should we end on that? It's a yeah. sad note, but... Yeah, go see Studio Six Six Six. It's mm -hmm. um, Cece's crying now. <laughs> it's a it's a beautiful film, and we are feeling Taylor Hawkins' loss. We are Team Chris Rock. Yeah. <laughs> yes, definitely, <laughs> definitely. <laughs> Hashtag. All right. All right. So long, everybody. I think next time we are going to change gears again and mm -hmm. do. I think we're going to do Honeysuckle Rose. Oh, yes. Either yes. that or Amadeus, if we are in an awake enough mood to do the two the hours long, and 40 yeah. minutes. <laughs> okay. <Yeah. laughs> anyway, take care, everybody. Um, take care of yourselves. Take care of the ones you love. And we'll be back soon. Bye. Bye. Under the moonlight, I'll sing you a song. So you'd magically feel a lot less alone. Hopefully, they'll live eternally If we paint ourselves all bright with stories Of heroes and poets and sadness and war Of immeasurable pain, unconditional love Movies about music